Hello and welcome to the formal pilot of the Vox Talks Tech podcast, which is going to be a show that I potentially run in the future, not at this point in time. This is a pilot kind of proof of concept to you guys showing what essentially I want the Vox Talks Tech podcast to be. I've done news podcasts, respond, you know, news videos and po- news podcasts and tried doing the podcast thing a couple times and this is really the format that I think it would do best and my goal is actually to do to, to and my goal is actually to do it live, even though I keep misspeaking, and that would be very fun live. But to do it live, have you guys watch it on Twitch if you're interested, and do a little Q&A session at the end, and then edit it up for the podcast platform. I do have a podcast account, if you're unaware, I have a link to it in the description below, as well as YouTube, and have that be a recurring thing. But uh, I, I am posing this as a proof of concept pilot, because I don't believe it is 100% worth the investment time takeaway at the moment for myself. And so while this may be a little bit of a controversial way to go, I am posing this as a essentially a Patreon milestone that we can reach, which is at a set milestone on my Patreon page. You know, there's little like at X amount of dollars per month, I can do this. At X amount of dollars per month, I can do this. And so I will set a goal and show it on screen here where if we reach this at some point in time, then that means that I can obligate myself to do a weekly news podcast I can have people on to talk about certain topics we'll do it live we'll have the video on YouTube and we'll have the audio podcast for those of you who just want the audio and it'll be pretty cool so I'm just going to dive into this week's topics and show you what the format looks like for me and how I expect it to go it'll be a little you know a little more clunky as I'm doing it live for the visuals but I can clean that up in the edit as well Um, but yeah here we go Oh yeah, I also wanted to mention that I'm working on relaunching my website with more news and article-friendly formats because there's a lot more I want to share, and so this will help further obligate me to finish that and to help show you guys that and keep pushing people over there as well. So we're getting a little further away from E3 than when I had intended to record this video, but I did want to mention I did record my uh, a separate podcast episode with my buddy BBK Dragon wrapping up my E3 recaps and thoughts and what we're looking forward to and what we were worried about and things like that. I'll have a link to it in the video description and I had all of my E3 reaction streams and things like that over on my gaming channel at, e- at youtube.com slash Gaming. so be sure to go check that out if you're interested. One of the things shown off quite a bit at E3 2019 that I was paying attention to and released a video that VOD of my live stream basically that some people didn't agree with necessarily which was AMD's Ryzen 3000 and then their new graphics cards the 5700 and the 5700 XT for Navi and I really have nothing positive to say about the graphics cards so I'm not really going to talk about them Uh, but I was interested in the processors because I do feel that you can get some great value going with AMD processors and NVIDIA GPUs for gaming rigs and things like that and honestly which is what I said in the stream if I was building my own gaming rig today with my own budget I would be using Ryzen because of the value that you get for it it's pretty good they're still on first gen there was still some you know individual single core performance issues but that seems to be something they want to address we'll see once benchmarks come out but the 16 core is incredibly impressive there's a lot you can do with it and it makes me all that much more excited for the Threadripper stuff there is a kind of slight rumor that there might be doing a 64 core Threadripper just to say they did it first which more on them I don't necessarily think that'll work out best for a bare metal single windows installation workflow because of all the issues with the scheduler and things like that which they have theoretically fixed they said they fixed but there could still be some performance loss that you see or you know Premiere and Resolve and things like that can't necessarily use all of that all of those cores for even 4k footage 8k you start to really use those core counts but 4k and 1080p can only use so many cores so I'm looking at a 20 to 30 core I know that sounds ridiculous to say but 20 to like 32 core Threadripper for Threadripper 3 I guess uh, and I'm sold but the big things that I want since obviously they have quite a few PCIe lanes on the consumer platform now. What I want from the HEDT platform, aside from more lanes and quad channel memory, is I want onboard Thunderbolt 3. They already have Ryzen 3000 boards with Thunderbolt 3, so give me onboard Thunderbolt 3, or USB 4, I guess. Uh, Onboard 10 gigabit, preferably dual, but single is fine. Lots of USB storage, lots of NVMe storage to use those extra lanes. Full kitted out PCIe lanes and slots, since I use seven in my main rig and more already. Uh, and then if there's still extra lanes to spare, then why don't we get the kind of, especially from Asus, the little DIM.2 style of NVMe RAID so that you have more physical room for more NVMe. If we get some sort of board like that, 
I am freaking sold. However, I'm a little concerned because there was a leaked, rumored X570 motherboard with prices approaching $800 for Ryzen 3000, which starts to really take away f more from the HED team market, and I, I don't know. I'm a little concerned here. It's something that I'm super stoked for. I realize it's a niche market, but it's a market that 100% meets my knees, needs, and I would very much look forward to moving over to Threadripper with Threadripper 3, as long as there's no major pitfalls or shortcomings that they run into with this new platform. I recently made a video about my Elgato Stream Deck XL, which I am in love with and is, you know, the upgrade I wanted to the original Stream Deck back in the day, and I'm always looking for new, you know, ways to show off the functionality that it can do and the things that it can do, especially in the professional broadcast and production field, and I did discover an article from PTZ Optics who makes a lot of the PTZ, pan, tilt, zoom cameras that are used in a lot of broadcasts and conferencing and things like that. And they have a whole article and video about how to use the Stream Deck to control PTZ cameras, which is really cool. So I just wanted to show that off and show, you know, there's a lot you can do with the Stream Deck, even if you don't see it in the mainstream, like, game streaming front end that it's typically made for. YouTube has announced and made quite a few changes to the way YouTube notifications work. They claim that they've completed or they fixed all of the outages, that there were actually outages before with notifications not going out, and that they have pretty much fixed that up and optimized it to the best that it can be, and they're quite confident and proud of this, so that says something. Uh, they've changed the UI so that it's more clear. They've done a lot of A-B testing and experimenting and survey gathering to try to make sure that it is as clear and as concise to people as possible, so you have... No recommendation or no notifications, personalized or partial recommendations, basically just like whenever it thinks you might specifically want this notification, and then all notifications. So you have to choose which one you want for a specific channel. And then they have some instructions for users how to make sure you actually have notifications enabled for the YouTube app, because otherwise you're not getting them anyway, and that's not YouTube's fault. YouTube has no control over that. That's the way the operating system on your mobile phone is designed. And then there is some analytics bits for creators to see how many people have all notifications enabled and how many of those people don't actually have it enabled on their phone because their phone settings are wrong so that you can communicate that better to your users or your viewers rather. I do have a blog post over on the TubeBuddy blog, which is a new post I will be writing for more often. So you can check that out linked in the description. Google Drive is separating Google Photos again. Uh, <laughs> about a year, a year and a half ago now, the Google Drive app combined with the Google Photos app, and then there was a the enterprise, like business level Google Drive subscription app. They all combined into Google Drive Sync, which combined your normal Google Drive cloud storage syncing software as well as the Google Photos software, which allowed you to automatically back up all your photos and you get X amount of free space if you compress your photos with your Google Drive account and yada yada. And to me, that made a lot of sense. Like it was a, compu a confusing migration at first because the settings were a little wonky and people didn't know what to expect, but once they once all was said and done you had all of your syncing done in one app and you had got to manage it all in one place and apparently that was still too confusing for users and so they're separating them again which just seems silly to me valve yet again has revealed after it was leaked the new ui design for steam i feel like we've seen the same conceptual steam ui design for five years now basically they've been waiting until they could finally cut off the <laughs> the uh, the the rotting limb that was Windows XP and Windows Vista support, which was keeping them from really updating the platform for like a decade now. And now that they have cut that off, they're finally like jumping in on redesigning the UI to be a little bit more modern, a little bit more user friendly, a little bit more flashy, a little quite a bit like some of the changes made to the Metro Steam skin, which was my favorite for a while until an update broke it. Uh, and they also are allowing game devs to like use a lot more assets and visuals for their games on their different game pages and store pages. And they're automatically using AI to kind of build that themselves in case devs don't have the time to do it, but then giving devs the option to manually use their own assets, which is pretty cool. I'd like to stop seeing teasers of it and just to start to see the real thing, but hey. It was announced that Destiny 2 on Google Stadia will have cross-save across all platforms, which was something that they announced at their E3 reveal, so that is good, but there won't be cross-play with PC users. Which is really baffling to me, because while they, yeah, they had to develop a separate Linux client, which they should also release to the public for people to play on Linux in the first place, it's still the PC copy. It should be using the same servers and everything else, so it shouldn't even be considered cross-play in the first place. But apparently there's a big enough differentiation that they are separating it. And one of the big arguments that I'm seeing is, do you really want laggy gamepad players playing with mouse and keyboard players? And 
to a degree, yeah, especially when much of the game is focused on PvE. And especially when it comes to competitive multiplayer, there are, like, most games these days have MMR, you know, matchmaking based on your skill set, even if they don't tell you, that theoretically it would separate all of those people together because their skill rank would be seen as the same and it would put them together and keep fighting them against each other instead of putting, you know, the most elite mouse and keyboard player versus the newbiest Stadia gamepad player. So I don't really see the concern here and I find it a little weird that PC doesn't have cross-play with PC. Makes me a little bit more concerned. I was actually pretty optimistic about Google Stadia and now I'm starting to get a little more concerned. There's been, over the past year, constant controversy over Twitch running ads promoting other streamers in big events, such as Ninja's football event and Pokemane's Fortnite event. I don't know. They, they had a bunch of sponsored brand deals with Fortnite streamers, and they were running ads for that on other streamers' channels. And a lot of streamers were reacting negatively to that and providing a lot of backlash. Twitch sent out an email and updating everybody on their policies that they've had going for it for a while, adding some clarity with regards to it basically telling people that they're sticking to their guns because they're going to continue to run ads about events on Twitch when it has to do with Twitch own, Twitch's own channels, such as slash Twitch, slash Twitch Presents, things like that, the Twitch Rivals broadcast, and that they do allow companies or brands to run ads with other streamers in them that promotes or endorses a specific brand or product. However, those ads do not direct to those streamers' personal channels, and therefore, you know, they're just running to the thing. And then they will also allow ads that promote or, you know, promote events on branded channels, but not the specific streamer's channel. So there's a little bit of a difference here. Yes, other streamers can appear in ads on your channel, but they won't, those ads aren't directing people to the specific streamer's specific channel. So I'm okay with this. I know a lot of people have some issue with this. And honestly, as a YouTuber who's always had YouTube video, you know, I can go make an ad right now and run it across all of... Paul's Hardware's videos, or Jay's Two Cents, or Linus's videos, and everybody who watches a Linus video with ads on is gonna see my face or something. Like, I can go do that right now, and I've always been able to do that, and everybody's already always been able to do that. So I've never seen it as a huge deal. Like, if they're there to watch you, they're gonna watch you, and usually the ads promoting other streamer events aren't even for that same day. It's like, hey, on this specific date, there's this event going on, you should come watch it, not hey, stop watching this streamer, come watch this streamer. So I'm okay with this, but they did add a little bit of clarification, and I wanted to point out that Twitch Turbo is still a thing. For whatever reason, Twitch doesn't talk about this or promote it anymore, and at one point it was part of Twitch Prime, and they have since removed it from Twitch Prime, which is a little annoying, uh, but you do still have the option of getting an ad-free experience on Twitch. You just have to pay for Twitch Turbo, and it, it, seem, it, it also helps keep your past broadcast for 60 days instead of the standard 14 days and you get some extra emoticons and some chat username colors like it is still a paid service that I feel like Twitch would benefit from promoting more so I just wanted to point that out as well took me a little bit to get in around to actually recording this so I had to cut a couple topics but this would go a little bit longer in the live format especially with a Q&A se segment at the end here which I may or may not include in the podcast based on your all's feedback but this is it this is you know, me reacting to tech news and then reacting to chat a little bit. This is the pilot concept that I wanted to convey to you guys. This is what I consider to be feasible for a some sort of weekly news podcast series talking about tech topics. And it's not even just going to be news. It's just going to be like relevant topics for the week as well as news, things like that. So this is what I think I want to do. And I will have my link to the Patreon in the Patreon tier if you think it's worth, you know, backing. This seems to be the thing that channels are doing that is really successful and that everyone tells me to get on, including viewers, is virtually everyone's big Patreon channels are bumped by having like this kind of weekly show. And I want to get in on that, not just for like money's sake, but like I genuinely want to have this kind of recurring show. I've wanted that for years. Like I watched shows like Co-Optional and things like and Wan Show and things like that. And I've always wanted my own recurring show. And so this is what I'm presenting as what the solo episodes will look like. It'll look a little bit different if I have collabs and I, I do want to have guests on fairly regularly and make it kind of like a friend chatting kind of thing. But here you go. Thank you for watching. Uh, links to everything, including the audio download for this, will be in the description down below. If you're interested, hit the like button if you enjoyed. Subscribe for more tech education. I'm Fox here to make tech easier and more fun. And I'll see you in the next video.